From the end of World War II until 1962, the Western world led by the United States and the communist world led by the Soviet Union are on a continuous path of collision as the Cold War explodes all over the world. The two sides face off in direct confrontation in Berlin and wage proxy conflicts in Czechoslovakia, Albania, Greece, Korea, Laos, Vietnam, and Cuba. And for 13 days in October 1962, the world comes closer to nuclear holocaust than ever before. This is Time Ghost, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. The Cuban Missile Crisis does not begin in Cuba. It has its roots in Berlin, Italy, and Turkey. The domestic political situation in the US, facing the newly elected President John F. Kennedy, and in the USSR, where Nikita Khrushchev takes power after a harsh four-year struggle following Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. But leader of the Soviet Union is not a comfortable position in which to be. He faces an ailing economy, the solution for which the party believes is partly an increased sphere of global control and more client states. He faces demands for reform and liberalization at home, but also the expectation to carry out an aggressive foreign policy to protect Soviet interests. And an important part of that policy is the nuclear arms race, where the USSR is way behind the United States. From 1957 to 1962, the number of operational American nuclear warheads goes from around 5,500 to an estimated 25,540. Over that time, the Soviets go from 660 to 3,346. Enough explosive power to destroy planet Earth several times over, sure, but still not even close to an actual balance of power. After Kennedy's election, this situation will worsen for the Soviets. When President Eisenhower, Kennedy's predecessor, was still in office, the Cuban Revolution had ousted Fulgencio Batista and put Fidel Castro at the head of a now communist Cuba. Despite extensive US support, a close ally of the US has fallen to communism. And according to Eisenhower's domino theory, more Latin American states will follow suit. And with revolutionary movements brewing all over the South American continent, that seems a plausible assumption. At first, the US administration chooses to observe and tolerate Castro until he confiscates and nationalizes all American assets on Cuban soil. The US answers with an embargo on Cuban goods and the economic isolation of Cuba. So in February 1960, Cuba enters into an economic alliance with the USSR. One month later, Eisenhower orders the US military to start training Cuban expats for an armed counter-revolution. Now, unlike the Soviet economy, the American economy has been growing vigorously, despite a brief recession in 57 and 58. The US avoided the destruction that befell the countries in which the Second World War had actually been fought, and capitalized on a post-war global economy that desperately needed rebuilding. Despite this, though, there are deep divisions and challenges on the home front. There is the big fear that communism will spread throughout the world and destroy the American way of life, or even result in another world war. What we oppose fundamentally is the aggressive nature of the communist state. It's unceasing effort to expand wherever it can, to grow bigger, to take over, to supplant. This deadly impulse toward aggression, we oppose as a continual threat to peace. Also, when the USSR puts the first satellite, Sputnik, into orbit in 1957, the American public wrongfully concludes that they have fallen behind the Soviets in technological development as well, and assumes that the Soviet Union has passed them in the nuclear arms race. There are racial and social injustices that split the electorate, and the young and ambitious senator from Massachusetts named John Fitzgerald Kennedy says he will take on all of these issues at once. He runs his presidential campaign in 1960 on a promise of change. He will reform the country to improve equality and liberty for all. He will boost the economy by promoting technological advancement and commerce. And above all, he will be aggressive with the Soviets and close that perceived missile gap. The choice for you is clear. The choice is between those who sit still and look to the past and between those who look to the future. Between those who recognize that in this deadly age, 
when we are involved in a close and narrow competition for survival, for the maintenance of freedom around the globe, with our adversaries, the communists, the best in this country can do is none too good. And therefore, I come here today and ask your help in moving this country forward again. Now, until the late 1950s, the prime deployment method for nuclear weapons was bombs carried on planes. Rocket development, though, is creating a new way to deploy them much further away and with less risk of being prevented or intercepted. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, can travel the globe in just dozens of minutes. Both the Soviet Union and the US work feverishly to develop functioning ICBM programs. And on both sides, it's proving to be a real challenge. In 1958, the Gaetan Report is issued by the U.S. Air Force, which assumes that Russian ICBM deployment has reached at least 130 units and will increase to close to 1,500 by 1963. At the same time, an independent CIA report concludes that the USSR has about 10 deployable ICBMs. In reality, the Soviets have four, of which two are untested prototypes, while the U.S. has a couple dozen. By 1962, the United States has 177 ICBMs, the Soviet Union still has fewer than 40. The Eisenhower administration is well aware that the Gaetan report is erroneous and even suspects that the CIA report is an overestimation. But political opponents of that administration leak the report and it's seized upon by Kennedy in his presidential campaign. So Kennedy hits the campaign trail promising to close the missile gap created by the Eisenhower administration's inaction in the arms race. Despite being repeatedly informed about the actual situation, Kennedy continues this rhetoric. Finally, in July 1960, Eisenhower summons both Kennedy and his running mate Lyndon Johnson to the White House and informs them personally of the actual situation. It is to no avail. For back on the campaign trail, Kennedy continues to slam Eisenhower for allowing the missile gap to arise. He even goes so far as to claim that he himself discovered the gap and coined the phrase. Kennedy's opponent, Richard Nixon, attacks Kennedy as being weak on fighting communism and, and too young to shoulder the challenges of the Cold War. We know the right way offered a way which would have lost us our friends in Latin America, the tremendous outrage that they exploded with once he made that very silly and foolish and immature suggestion of his that we ought to intervene directly in Cuba. Now, of course, he's jumped off of it. But let me just say one thing with regard to that. Can America in this time afford a well-intentioned man, but a man who frankly doesn't know the situation and who says one thing today and another thing tomorrow. That kind of a man Mr. Khrushchev will make mincemeat of. That's what I'm talking about. Kennedy counters by upping the anti-communist rhetoric and continuing his claims about the non-existent missile gap. As the election approaches, the candidates are neck and neck. Kennedy barely ekes out the win with a margin of the popular vote of 0.17%, carrying four fewer states than Nixon, but winning 303 votes of the Electoral College. Allegations of voter fraud and irregularities follow, and the bitter, close campaign leaves Kennedy with a less than optimal amount of popular support. We now know that Kennedy and his brother, soon to be Attorney General Robert Kennedy, believed in a dialogue with the Soviets, but harsh measures against Cuba. And even before Kennedy took office, they opened a direct back-channel communication line to the Soviet Union through the spy Georgi Bolshakov, a highly positioned Russian intelligence operative with direct access to Khrushchev. Now, this contact was reported to the FBI and CIA and was never covert. But as the situation between the superpowers deteriorates, it soon becomes a vital part of the regular intelligence and diplomatic operations of the Kennedy administration. And Kennedy has made public promises that he now needs to keep. One of his early actions as president will be to continue the planned covert invasion of Cuba already put in motion by Eisenhower. In April 1961, three months after taking office, he orders the invasion that will soon be known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. On April 17th, close to 1,500 CIA-trained Cuban exiles descend on Cuba's Bay of Pigs, supported by eight B-26 bombers and five supply ships. 
facing them are 25,000 soldiers, 200,000 militia, and 9,000 police. And it does not take long before the invasion becomes a fiasco, and a very public fiasco. The reaction and condemnation by Cuba and the Soviet Union are swift and angry. And in the following months, Bobby Kennedy will meet Bolshakov a total of 19 times in order to try to patch up relations to little avail. The Kennedy administration continues to look for ways to overthrow or undermine the Castro government, though. But despite the situation in Cuba, a summit between Kennedy and Khrushchev goes ahead in June. The main topic on the agenda is Berlin, and both parties walk away satisfied that they have prevailed, while in actual fact they have achieved nothing. Days later, Kennedy announces an increase in the U.S. armed forces by over 20% to protect the world from the USSR. He also specifically increases the troops deployed to Berlin. Khrushchev, who is on vacation on the Black Sea at the time, is reportedly furious, but that is only the beginning of his problems. That same month, the U.S. starts deploying mid-range ballistic missiles in Italy. In contrast to ICBMs, MRBMs do exist in large amounts. These missiles now allow the U.S. to strike at the Russian heartland within minutes of an outbreak of war. More MRBMs are positioned in NATO ally Turkey, even closer to Russia. Kennedy is delivering on his promise to close that imaginary missile gap. But to do this quickly, he and his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, must rely on existing and tested missile technology. And the only missiles that exist in large enough amounts are the PGM-19 Jupiter missiles. Developed in 1954 and produced from 1956, these are already dated by 1961, but more importantly, they stand above the ground so they can easily be spotted and destroyed by airstrikes. So they're fairly useless as defensive weapons and only really good for a first strike. It does not take long for the USSR to find out what's going on, and Khrushchev's frustration and fury continue to grow. The next challenge comes when East Germany closes the border between East and West Berlin to the passage of civilians in order to stop the brain bleed of East German academicians, technicians, and engineers leaving in droves through the open border. Kennedy responds by calling in 148,000 reserves to potentially defend Berlin. In October, after a few incidents where army vehicles are not allowed to cross the border, Kennedy's special envoy to Berlin, retired General Lucius Clay, decides to test the borders to see that U.S. Army vehicles still have, in fact, free passage over that border. The test vehicle passes through. However, to be safe, the Americans backed up the test by parking a few tanks on their side of the border. The USSR also parked tanks on its own side. When the Americans see that everything is normal, they call their tanks back. But the Soviets misunderstand this move and think that they're only retreating because of them. So they roll into Friedrichstrasse towards Checkpoint Charlie, the main American army border crossing. The American tanks quickly turn around and take up aggressive positions on their side of the border. So there they stand, fewer than 80 meters apart for the next 48 hours. Kennedy and Khrushchev negotiate who will pull back first. In the end, they agree the Soviets should pull back five meters first, then the Americans, and so on in steps. Although somewhat comical in nature, the incident has serious implications as both sides walk away with the impression that the other side is ready to go to war over Berlin. Both Khrushchev and JFK are actually recorded at the time saying they don't care that much for the fate of Berlin, despite making public statements to the contrary. That does not really matter, though, as the allies of both countries care very much about Berlin, so the USSR and the US are left with little choice. Meanwhile, the pressure on Khrushchev to do something about the overwhelming US nuclear superiority is mounting. By May 1962, he has a plan. He asks Fidel Castro to allow him to do the same thing the U.S. did in Turkey and Italy. Put a few MRBMs in their front yard. 
Castro reluctantly agrees and the construction of missile sites begins. Despite all of this, during the summer of 1962, Kennedy is still under attack for being too soft on communism and the Soviet Union. So at the White House press conferences on September 4th and September 13th, he publicly warns Cuba and the USSR that the United States will not tolerate any nuclear buildup on Cuba and will take forceful actions to prevent it. He will go on record as regretting this warning when, on October 16, 1962, American spy planes discover the missile sites and the 13 most dangerous days in human history begin. Not kidding about that. The 13 most dangerous days in our history. If you'd like to see some other dark days when the future was being decided, you can click right here for our video on the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact just before World War II broke out. It is the Time Ghost Army that in these dark times in 2020, finances our programming. So please join us at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. See you next time.